and they do. Here's the other thing that's interesting. Uh, what it is that people think that they're really struggling with, but at least when it pertains to doubt, they're usually wrong as to the kind of doubt that they're actually struggling with. When you talk with people on the street, you say, well, what is it that you're struggling with? They think that they're dealing with intellectual doubts pertaining to, in this case, I'm only dealing with the Christian faith. I'll let friends of other faiths uh, defend themselves. But I'm here to deal with the Christian faith. And they say, well, a lot of my, my, my struggles are intellectual with Christianity, when in fact, studies have shown most of them aren't intellectual, even in nature. So here's what I want to do. I want to I just canvas a little bit the kinds of doubts that are out there. And then I'm going to focus tonight on one kind, and then we'll get into a couple other things over the next couple of weeks. How does that sound? Tonight we're going to focus on emotional doubt, but let me just throw a few things at you. There are intellectual doubts to Christianity. So when doubting is intellectual, here's the thing. The doubter should explore rational reasons for that doubt, as well as answers and resources that could respond to the questions that you have pertaining to your intellectual doubts. Uh, there are some people, when it comes to Christianity, you think of like a Richard Dawkins or somebody else, and they'll say, well, we have evolution, and since evolution it comes from the origin of life, then we don't need Christianity. That was a story that we needed before we had what Darwin was providing. Well, to be honest, Darwin didn't provide an account of the origin of anything. Evolution, if anything, only works on things that already exist. And Darwin knew that. If you read The Origin of Species, he even pointed that out. What is the origin of thing? I'm not sure that I answered that question. But I have given account of adaptation. Okay. But it came up as something of an intellectual kind of concern pertaining to the Christian faith. Uh, there are physical doubts that we deal with. This sounds strange, but it's actually true. These are doubts that arise from not being our physical best. Have you ever been there before? Uh, some things could include sleep. I, I want to make a suggestion to you tonight. Maybe the most spiritual thing that you can do is to go to bed sometime and actually get a little bit of rest. Uh, Paul Copan shared this. He said one Yale grad student wrote to him, uh, wrote about his university experience that when he would doubt God's existence, he would get some rest to regain an inner equilibrium. He said the thing was, is after he rested well, the doubts tended to just go away. So here's the thing. When we're not at our physical best, we may be more susceptible to doubts. There's a New Testament scholar. His name is D.A. Carson, Don Carson. And he said doubt may be, may be fostered by sleep deprivation. Sometimes the godliest thing you can do in the universe is just to get a good night's sleep. Jordan Peterson, some of you probably heard of Jordan Peterson, anybody? Uh, he wrote 12 Rules for Life. I actually started reading that. And it's interesting, even in the first chapter, he said, one of the things I do when I'm dealing with, with his uh, people that he's counseling, he said, there's some questions that I'll always ask them because and their anxiety levels are really high or they're, they're struggling a lot with depression. He said, one of the things that I'll do is I'll ask them about their sleep patterns and we'll restructure their sleep patterns. He said, immediately, they're almost always helped. He said, but one of the other things that I ask them is, is what do you eat for breakfast? That's probably not a question you think you would get when you go to a counselor, but he said he always asks it. For those of you that read the book, you know what I'm talking about. But when he says, I ask him, what did you eat for breakfast? He said, the thing is, is he said, I always recommend people eat high protein in the morning and get some fats in your system. He says, so for people that are actually struggling with some things, it turns that what you eat in the morning makes a big difference. The only reason that I bring up physical doubts is sometimes we think that there's something going on up here that we're really wrestling with, when in fact, there's something not going on in here, or there might be something going on in your sleep patterns that have just kind of thrown you off. By the way, there's a beautiful example of just this point. Uh, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 19, you can write that down in part, but in 1 Kings chapter 19, there's a guy named Elijah. And Elijah had accomplished quite a lot to the Lord, uh, to his credit. But he has this lady, Jezebel, that's kind of after him because he's getting a little bit of a, a, of a reputation. She's like, this guy has to be stopped. And so when she puts a hit out basically on his head, he goes into a frank, it basically becomes frantic. And if you look at 1 Kings 19, it's interesting because the thing that he gets is, is he goes and he gets sleep. And then it says that when he experienced depression, he lays down to sleep. And after Elijah had rested, an angel came to him and recommended that he get food. And after this happens a couple of times, Elijah says, and I've basically felt back to my normal self. Sometimes we just have physical things that are going on with us that need to be addressed. And it's not the thing that we're thinking that it is. So sometimes we do have intellectual doubts. I don't make any bones about it. I get it. I've even had questions about my faith. Sometimes they're physical doubts. 
A lot of times, though, there are emotional doubts. Emotional doubts. According to Gary Abernass, he has a book called Dealing with Doubt. I highly recommend it. He said, emotional doubt is where the factual data is judged by how one feels about it rather than its own merits. And so instead of coming to grips with the strength of the evidence, the one experiencing the quandary often responds by emoting about it. Now, by the way, this is important because that differs from intellectual doubts uh, where the person really has reservations about the truthfulness of Christianity. So now we're going to focus on emotional doubts. I'll get to that in a little bit because I'm going to show you different causes of emotional doubts. One other candidate for doubt, moral doubts. Now let me tell you when these things come up, and many of you might have experienced something like this in your life. But it's when a person is making a moral decision in their life that they know that is at odds with the teachings of, in our case, we're just worried about Christianity, right? But they're making moral choices that they know will fit what Jesus has commanded. And they feel like they have a choice that they have to make. Is it this way of life, or is it going to be the Christian way of life? And as a result, there's kind of an uneasiness, or as the existentialists of life say, that they become ill at ease about things. But what they're very sure about is they can't have it both ways. Sometimes the moral choices that we make really shape the things that we're willing to believe. But let's talk a little bit more specifically about emotional doubt. And let me tell you why. Some of the early studies on, on doubt indicated that 70% of the doubt that people deal with are emotional in nature. They're not intellectual even in nature. They're emotional. Uh, some of the more recent studies have indicated that number could be as high as 80% of the concerns or the objections that people have pertaining to the Christian faith have nothing to do with the truth claims that Christianity makes. Instead, it's something emotional. Let me show you some of the candidates that are out there as to why people struggle with the Christian faith. And here's the first. Christian hypocrisy. Christian hypocrisy. Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to get up here and defend Christians' mistakes. Instead, if you're a Christian, let me just tell you to get up and to do something about the mistakes that you've made. Doubt can be caused by observing beliefs and actions of believers. It just can. Uh, there's a list, by the way, um, of wars, persecutions, race, uh, women's rights, and social justice are some of the things that people tend to, to bring up with this concern. However, while to view what is believed to be unbiblical positions can be disheartening, and I get that, we need to remember something. Christianity is not true because Christians hate Christianity. That isn't what makes Christianity true. If Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. Period. That's the end of it. And even if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I remember having this conversation with a friend, you know, and he said the problem with faith is that you can't prove it false. There's no way, because you just have this belief that it's intractable. There's nothing that would penetrate it. I said, well, actually, what you just said is false. Because I can't tell you when I would leave the Christian faith. And I get it, by the way, strangely enough, from the Bible. Because what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we have been lied to. And our labor, because he's writing this to a church, he says, when we labor in vain, I can tell you, if it's not the bones of Jesus, God, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. I can tell you the conditions under which I would walk away from the Christian faith. But here's the thing pertaining to Christian hypocrisy. In 2007, and the studies are pretty, pretty true even to you today, the Barner Group did research, a research project in which they asked non-Christian people why they reject Christianity. Why do you? And many Christian leaders were surprised to learn that none of the top six answers had anything to do with the evidence for Christianity at all. None of the top six. They rejected Christianity for moralistic reasons. The top three problems people had with Christianity, one of those included Christians are judgmental, that was 87%. And hypocritical, that was 85%. So two of the top three reasons that people said that they did not have anything to do with Christianity had to do with the behavior of Christians. It reminds me of a story years ago when Mahatma Gandhi was going into a church and he had been reading the Bible and he was finding that Jesus could really actually be the answer to the things that were troubling the people back in his homeland in India. There could be something that breaks down the caste system where people are treated as equals and welcome, and no one is considered an outcast. 
And so he goes in a time of despair. He goes into a church, comes into a foyer. And when he goes into it, by the way, that dark skin, he's greeted by some people in the foyer. They told him that his kind wasn't welcome there. Now, here's what he went on to say. He went on to say, I would have been a Christian if it weren't for Christians. You can understand the emotion behind it, but do you see the mistake? Christianity was never true. Never even claimed to be true. Because I, or somebody else that calls himself a Christian, that hates Christian. I also want to throw this out there. If you're a Christian, you hate Christian. Can I just throw that out there? Because people do struggle with it. Christian hypocrisy. Here's another emotional reason. Peer pressure. Did you know peer pressure is a real thing? And by the way, it goes every single direction. There's great peer pressure for a person that has more or less cast their lot into a world view. And then they come to a time where they're like, I don't know that this is true. But they're known for representing that world view. I mean, can you imagine somebody like Richard Dawkins, who is a world-renowned world atheist, coming out and saying, you know what? After considering the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus, I've decided that I'm going to be a Christian. Could you imagine something like that happening? Well, here's the thing. On his side, he has written books. He's been speaking in conferences. He's been going all around the world, basically arguing against, usually Christianity, but arguing against belief in God, saying that it's toxic for everything. He's got a lot of skin in the game. And so you can see, even if he started to consider the merits and the claims of Christianity, he's sort of locked into a thing that he's known for. That's kind of an aspect of peer pressure. But in this case, I'm talking about peer pressure in another way. There are a lot of things about Christianity, folks, that are not voted. Did you know that? There are a lot of the moral teachings of Christianity that when traditionally construed, they're just not popular. And you can feel this pressure. Uh, this, this is why when it comes to this, you know, sometimes it says, well, are you really going to believe the teachings of an old book? By the way, if something is old, it doesn't mean it's false. So maybe the answer is, yeah, something can be old and true simultaneously. But I want to be more specific. To be more like our peers is often a desire, which is difficult not to heed, at least in part. In fact, the belief, whether true or false, that few other intelligent persons hold our position can produce devastating results, and especially over a period of time. And so here's the canard that gets thrown around, which kind of means a lot. But here's the thing that gets thrown around here about Christianity. If you're going to be a Christian, that means that by definition you have to be anti-intellectual. And so there's a lot of shame that gets tied into it. That would be an aspect of your oppression. Here's another one. Someone who judges things by our feelings. I want to be clear about something. Your feelings are a part of who you are. They're not an inherently bad thing, but they may not be your best guide. When we judge by the common problem, especially with Christians who lack assurance of salvation, or it comes from reactions based on your feelings, like sometimes I don't feel safe. By the way, sometimes I don't feel safe. And I'm the pastor of this church. Uh, I don't have the same feelings about God that I used to. Have you ever felt something like that? Well, at those times, maybe what we need to do is make sure that our feelings aren't the thing that's you know, driving the car. We need to make sure that other things are what is actually leading us in the right direction. Here's another thought, another emotional thought. There's some tough doctrines that Christianity affirms. And instead of talking about those doctrines, I actually want to give you an example. This week I was reading Charles Darwin's autobiography, 1848. And it was the year 1848, and the months before his father's death, he was reading a lot of religious works. And some of the works were by a guy named Samuel Coleridge Taylor. And Samuel Coleridge Taylor warned that those who reject God when they die they're separated from God. And here's what Darwin said. He said, I can, I, can, I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. For if so, if so the plain language of the text seems to show that men who do not believe, and this would include my father, he said, my brother, and almost all of my friends, would be everlastingly punished. He said, so I won't accept it. And by the way, what he wasn't doing was considering the merits of what the text says. Whether we can make sense out of the doctrine of hell, even though the doctrine of hell is a tough one, can we make sense out of it? 
Instead, it was an emotional reaction that said, this would mean that my father, my brother, and other people that I, people that I love, that means that they're not with God, so I'm just going to ditch the doctrine. It was a tough doctrine to swallow. Here's the thing, at the request of his wife, because I just read something that he said, but at the request of his wife, Emma, those lines that I just read to you, they were struck from the published version. And the reason that they were struck from the published version is she says, because the words that he revealed just seem so raw. Well, I can imagine. Here's another emotional reason that we struggle. Sometimes we struggle with life experiences. We just do. Since I'm on that garden, let me just stay there. How does that sound? Charles Darwin's daughter, and she died shortly after her 10th birthday. And Darwin was so struck with grief that he couldn't even attend his own daughter's funeral. There was a PBS documentary on Darwin, and it reported this. It said, Annie's death marked the final destruction of Darwin's faith in a beneficent God and a just and moral universe. He just did not know how to handle it. Sometimes when we run into suffering in the world, it just throws us in a place that we don't know where to go. And we come to a place also where we think that a good and loving God would not let me endure the death of a daughter or the death of a son or something like that. All of these things, if you think about it, though, are talking about who we are as emotional creatures. And that is a part of who we are. But it doesn't necessarily speak to the truth claims about Christianity. So I don't know if you're sitting out there tonight and you're struggling with doubt. Tonight I was really worried about emotional doubt. If 70 to 80 percent of the people are saying, really, really, at the end of the day, it's my emotions, then we needed to start there. But I also want to make some suggestions to you tonight on how to overcome emotional doubt. Because when I look back at my life, especially as I was a kid, I suffered quite a lot. Some of you have heard the story. And there were a few times where I thought, this is it. I mean, this, this is it. One night in particular, I remember when I go to sleep tonight, that's it. I'm not waking up in the morning. God had other plans, and that's okay. But it's the way that I was viewing things. And I remember coming to a place where I was sitting in my home. I was severely asthmatic. It debilitated me. And I remember sitting on the floor, and I'm fighting for air, and I'll never forget sitting there saying, where in the world are you? Stop this. Just stop this. Because I was sick of suffering. I was just sick of it. Now again, God had other plans. I'm sitting here. But the question for us tonight is, what kind of doubt do you deal with? Is it emotional? Is it intellectual? Here's some thoughts on overcoming emotional doubt. One, for those of you that are believers, I don't want you to ever forget what we're supposed to take from this. And in Jude, chapter, in Jude 22, it says, have mercy on those who are dying. Have mercy on those who are dying. There's a ministry that we have here at the church. It's called Stephen Ministry. Now, these people are very well trained. But you know what they're not? They're not counselors. It's not what they are. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to walk with people through life. And even if you look at the book of Job, and I have to go read it tonight. If you look at the book of Job, one of the things which you find is Job asked God a lot of questions, and God doesn't answer any question for him. Instead, what he says in all this Job, he said that you needed my presence, and here I am. Here I am. He answered his questions with a bunch of questions. God's good at asking questions. But for the people of God, let me just encourage you. Remember Jude 22. Have mercy on those who are doubting. Here's another thing to keep in mind. Doubt can be the birth pains of a deep in faith. It can be the birth pains of a deep in faith. By the way, for every lady that's in this room, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a birth pain. For those of you that have baby, they're real. But on the other side of that pain, there's a blessing. And sometimes the doubts that we go through, the struggles that we go through, if we get to a place where we will let God do this thing, we find that there is something on the other side of it. And frankly, we wouldn't be the person that we are with Alex. Sometimes doubt would be the birth pains of a deepened faith. You know, if you get to a place, I love George Yancey, he's a sociologist, and he was writing about a time where he was struggling emotionally with, with his faith. And he said, I got to a place, he said, the reason I'm struggling emotionally is he's, 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 a, he's African American, he's a professor of sociology, he was dating a white woman. 
And he said her family didn't approve of the relationship. He said, honestly, they weren't believers anyway, so that wasn't it. He said, but all of her friends who were believers didn't support the relationship because they didn't believe in interracial romance. And so he said, as a result, when she broke up, or when they broke up, he said, I really cared about her, threw me into a pretty dark place. He said, their reaction didn't help. Because instead of just seeing me as a man, they were seeing me as a black man. He said it threw, it threw his, his faith into question. Now, he said, so even though I'm sitting there questioning, he said there's a time where I'm sitting there going, this is the worst time to ask questions, is when emotionally I'm not already connected to Christians. He said, but there I went with it, and I got on the other side of it. He said, now I thank God for it, because my faith deepened because of the struggle. A third thing I want you to keep in mind tonight, keep the main thing the main thing. It's very simple. Keep the main thing the main thing. You remember earlier I was talking about Paul Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he says, I give to you something that is of first importance. And what was of first importance? He said that he died and that he rose. That's a matter of first importance. Uh, let me tell you a matter that is not of first importance. Um, evolution. I'm telling you, we can debate it, but that's not a matter of first importance. If Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. What about evolution? Interesting talk. If Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. Even the problem of eating on the problem of suffering, that people, like I just gave a little bit of my story, it becomes so pronounced to their experience, keep the main thing, the main thing. If Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. We could do this all night, everybody, because there's any kind of array of experiences that you're going to have in your life that makes you go, oh my gosh, keep the main thing, the main thing. Draw your eye back to what Christianity is about. And what that means is that there has to be a place where that doctrine that you died and that you rose is what checks up against your emotions and keeps them in the place that they're supposed to be. And think of the hope that's in there, right? I mean, if death didn't stop, and trust me, nothing is going to stop it. It's a great place to be. And then there's one other thing that I want to encourage you to remember tonight. Folks, sometimes you have to get the help that you need. You have to get the help that you need. What's your struggle? If your struggles really are intellectual in nature, can I encourage you to go to a person that will have the answers to those questions? And by the way, not everybody does. Not everybody's actually done their homework. It matters who you go to. But get the help that you need. If you're a person that has endured tremendous abuse in your life, let me encourage you, get the help that you need. If what it is that you need is a good counselor, trust me, I'm here to help you. Not as a counselor, because I'm not licensed, but to help you find the help that you need. The thing is, is we were never meant to go through any of this on our own anyway. It was not like that. And given that there's such a barrage of things in our experience that can bring us to a place where I don't even know what to think about things, you see why I'm saying what I'm saying about point number four? Get to a place where a person who can speak the truth and love to you and walk with you and help you find the way. Honestly, folks, that's what Veritas is about. And that's why we have the format that we do. We want to get to the place where you're allowed to ask the questions that you've got. And maybe, by God's grace, I'm going to give you some answers to those questions. In fact, that's actually what I want to do right now. I want to turn to the questions. So I don't know how many of you had your phone out. Melody's going to join me up here with a lovely table. And we want to hand it over to you. All right, guys. Sorry. Okay, so it's the Q&A time. This is the audience interaction time. So, as you can see on the screen, if you grab your phone, you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. If you have any questions about doubt, this is when we want to hear from you. Now, over the next few weeks, we will be dealing with the different types of doubt. So, if we don't get to your question today, it, there will be many more opportunities for your questions to be answered. But we want to make sure that we get as many questions in as we can today. Um, also, if you want to go to our website, veritaswc.com, there are places where you submit uh, questions for upcoming topics. Um, we'll be hanging out with Dow here for the next couple of weeks. 
and moving on to other topics. So we want to hear from you what, what your uh, questions and what, what things are heavy on your heart. Um, as you go to menti.com and you put in our code 926051, you can see questions that other people submit and you can vote on questions that you'd like to have answered tonight. Um, or you can submit questions yourself. Um, as you guys are doing that, uh, I thought I'd start out with a couple um, as we were getting some of the questions submitted. So you described one instance in your life um, where you have um, questions God's goodness in this period of your suffering. Um, are there other times when circumstances or um, or how you were feeling specifically caused you to question not only God's goodness but His existence? And then, what, how did you respond in that moment? What did you do to move through that? Right. Uh, it, it, all right. So here's the thing. You, you saw a list of kinds of doubt that, that we can deal with. There's not just one. Did you know that you can start struggling with more than one kind at a time? Isn't this a blessing tonight? You can have intellectual doubts and emotional doubts at the same time, right? You can have intellectual, you can have emotional and moral doubts at the same time. You know, when I when I look back at the things that I struggled with, uh, yeah, the problem of suffering, which was was real for me. Uh, what are some things that, that got me through that? One was my parents. Honestly, it was just my parents. I mean, they were they were an absolute rock. And that's why I was saying with Job, he says, you know, in all of this, Job, he said that you needed me. And here I am. That was God's response to him. He needed his presence, and he had his presence. And that's when Job looks at it and goes, oh, right. You know, I did say that. And you have been here. Uh, but we also need the presence of people that are going to be kind of a backbone when you're kind of bending over a little bit. You know, and struggle under the weight of the situation that we're dealing with. And I had that in the family that I had. But I also want to throw this out there. There was a season where I struggled because of moral doubt. I mean, I was I was the guy that got to a place where I had a life that I was living. I knew what it is that Jesus expected. And by the way, this was even as a person that said he believed in Jesus. I knew the life that I was living. I knew what it was that he expected. And I knew that I had a choice that I had to make. So I feel a lot like Augustine. Some of you know Saint Augustine. That's what I call him Augustine. Augustine's your grass, all right? Uh, it's Augustine. And Saint Saint Augustine, if you read his confessions, it's raw. It's really honest. And he admitted. He says, you know, I have a problem with. Uh, well, he had a problem with women. That's what he had a problem with. He was a womanizer. And one of the things that he says at points, he says, "Lord, make me chase, just not yet." Have you ever felt that way before? Lord, make me chase, just not yet. And that was exactly me. I'm saying, oh, here's my life, here's what Jesus expects. I feel like I have a choice I have to make. And I did. Now, I'm not going to give you the rest of the story, you know, but here is a thought. How many of you just say, okay, I've been in the exact same place? You know, it can throw you a, a little bit. And sometimes the response, by the way, is a delay. Uh, I want to say that God is like a hound of heaven. Those of you who have ever heard the poem, you know, the hound of heaven that pursues and pursues and pursues. And at every turn for me, every time, every time I turn back, he was waiting there going, Are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? So those are a couple of a couple of things. I don't know if it's helpful, but those are a couple of thoughts that throw out. That's a great answer. Great answer. Now, here's a great question that was just submitted is did Jesus doubt? And what does that mean for the Trinity? Did Jesus doubt? Uh, I don't see evidence that Jesus doubted. What I do see is evidence that Jesus struggled with what he knew. And there is a difference. If you see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, and he says, Lord, if there's any other, Father, if there's any other way that we can do this, he sees his, his suffering is, is right on. Is there another way, folks, uh, that you can't get more honest than that moment right there? But it wasn't like he was sitting there going, What is it that I'm really supposed to do here? He knew. He was just struggling because he he knew what was waiting for him. So I don't see any evidence that what you see in Jesus is, is doubting with anything. But no, here's the thing. You can still struggle with what you know you ought to be doing. The good thing about Jesus is he models by example in that. that he was unwavering for what he knew. That's good. Another question that was submitted is, please distinguish doubt that honors God and doubt that is not. Okay, I think that's a great question. So what's a doubt that honors God? Uh, I think it's those kinds of things that come from real questions that we have. I think God's okay with that. 
You'll never find an instance in Scripture where a person asks God a question where you're trying to understand it, and he goes, don't ask me questions. You're just not going to find that. However, if you look over in James, you know, James says that we're not supposed to be double-minded. And if you look at that, you go, well, exactly. And so isn't doubt basically a manifestation of a double mind? And the answer is, no, it's not. Uh, because the difference that you have in, in James when it's saying, talk about a double-minded believer, is it's really talking about you trying to have a double allegiance. So it's like saying, well, I'm going to worship money and Jesus. No, you're not. One's going to win at the end of the day. I'm going to worship this and Jesus. No, you're not. You're double-minded. Something is going to win at the end of the day. Probably not Jesus, if we're honest with ourselves, at least for a while, right? That's what it means to be a double-minded person. But it doesn't mean is to say that there aren't going to be moments that you have real struggles. We've already seen it in Jesus and Gethsemane, have Where you're going to have real struggles. And the way that it's described from Jesus, that struggle is so real, much like when he had to go with the temptations early in, the, in Mark's Gospel. Those temptations were so real to him after he had fasted for 40 days. And then the temptations happened. It says that angels had to come and attend to him. Folks, if they had to come and attend to him, they're going to need to come and attend to you. As well, some of the things that we struggle with, and this is kind of the point. If you look at Ephesians chapter six, it, it talks about putting on the armor of God. And why is that? Is because some of the stuff we struggle with, folks, is just pure spiritual. It's what it is, and it glosses itself in a different veneer. Maybe it glosses itself as an intellectual doubt, when in fact it's something spiritual going on that we're wrestling with. It's kind of a follow-up question to that one: Is doubt a sin? The kind of doubt that is a sin, not all doubt is. So if you're trying to put the puzzle together and you don't know quite how the pieces fit together, again, I think that's the kind of thing that, that God is, is very understanding about. But if you're talking about the kind of doubt where we doubt God's goodness because we are double-minded in the sense that James 2 talks about, then we've gone to a place that is, that is sinful. So is it inherently wrong to doubt? I don't necessarily see any evidence for that. Is doubt sinful? And the answer is, it could be. It could be. Are we talking about the kind of doubt where I'm split between my affections on who it is that I'm really going to give myself to? And if the answer is yes, then you've gone to a place of sin. You guys are really not holding back. You're giving them all the really tough okay. ones. Uh, just so you guys know, I mean, he, he can handle it, so let him have it. Okay? Okay. Let him have it. Yes. <laughs> That's not fun. He's got a PhD. It'll be okay. Um, okay, so emotions are really super complex, and they're often multi-layered and multifaceted. And sometimes it's hard to even identify an emotion as a doubt. So how can you go about healthy, being healthy and unpacking that type of emotion and being able to really deal with the core of yeah, you know, David, if, if you go back to the Old Testament, David lost a son. And the way that his grief is described, it gets to a place where God basically gets in front of him and says, man, you need to stop. Now, I remember reading that narrative and going, that seems like a strange thing to say, uh, especially for a person that's grieving something that, that should be grieved. It wasn't that God had a problem with David grieving. It said he had a problem with how David, how David was, was grieving. Here's the way that I look at it. When, you're, when you get to a place where your emotions have control over you, you've gone to an unhealthy place. And here's why. It's because your emotions are only a part of you. They're not you. you know, who am I? I'm just an emotional person. No, you're a lot more, you might be an emotional person, right? But there's a lot more to you than just your emotions. Something else that's a part of you, by the way, is your values, right? And so we have to be checking things all the time based on, you know, what does the Word of God say? Let's go back to that. How do I know when my emotions are misleading me? Sometimes they're misleading me because they lead me to immoral places. And that's when I know that my emotions have taken over the ship. They're the ones that's, take, that, that's basically in control, and they're running them up. Even if you think about sitting here tonight, or you go into a church where you're, you're a member of a church, you know, even Jane, in, in the first John 4, it says, test the spirit of teaching. And you test it by what? You test it by the word of God. All right. So what am I supposed to test my emotions by? Guess what? You test them by the word of God. And you see whether or not they're taking you to a place that gets you closer to him or is pulling you away from him. 
I think that's a pretty healthy way to go. What's the word God said? If you don't know what the word God says, here's the thing. Remember point number four? Go to somebody that does. And let them guide you. Let them walk through it with you. Great. Great answer. Another question that was submitted. Uh, it's a little bit uh, of a bad story here. So they say sometimes when times get very hard and I feel really sad or burdened, oftentimes people make me feel like that's wrong, uh, but people in the Bible cry out to God. Is being in that place the same place as doubt? No. You might just be totally aware of what you're going through, and it might just be really hard. And that's all right. Uh, nobody, listen, nobody, uh, and think of some of the examples that we've talked about tonight. Will we ever look at a person who's lost a kid you know, and say, you know what, I, I, I don't think that you need to have the feelings that you have? Right? That sense of loss is what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't think anybody would offer that kind of advice. There is, there is a healthy grief, right? Uh, and so it's just part of, a part of who we are. Uh, I don't know if that helps at all, but no, I even look at Jesus. By the way, you know I was up to Jesus, right? And you know, when you look at Jesus, if he struggled with the things of the world culture, or struggle with the things of the world, it's just going to happen. I just want to struggle like he struggled with the things of the world. So rather than let it basically take over his response, his reaction, and his life and his obedience, he stayed the course, but was really honest about it. Can you be more honest than Gethsemane? I mean, can you? I mean, that's a moment was like, I know what I'm supposed to do. This is hard. And you see that evidence all throughout Scripture. It's not just with Jesus. Paul's obedience. That guy was beaten nearly to death one time. Thrown outside the gates of a city. Everybody thinks he's dead, by the way. He's literally laying there. All of his disciples are like looking at what they think is a corpse of a body. And after a little bit, Paul sits up, probably a creepy moment. But he sits up, right? And they're like, whoa! And he goes, we're going back into the city. All right, now that's obedience, and that's hard obedience, but it was staying the course that God had portioned for him. But was he totally aware of what was waiting for him when he went back in? Yeah, he had just gotten the whole brunt of it before. It wasn't as if were, I think it's going to be totally different when I walk in this time. <laughs> it just wasn't. He's was like, well, I just about died there. Uh, you all ready to go back in? Those guys haven't even taken the beating that he had taken. And they're probably sitting there going, I don't know that I'm ready to watch that even again. Paul's like, it's time to go. Sometimes what it is that we go through, folks, that's what I'm saying. We struggle with it. It's not because we're doubting. It's because we're totally aware of the reality that we're in. That's awesome. So here's another question. Where do you think the source of doubt comes from? Is it, it and at what part does Satan play in doubt? Is he still constantly fighting for us? Is he the one spurring these doubts? Well, that's why I brought up, it's a great question, that's why I brought up Ephesians 6, when it says to put on the full armor of God. And by the way, you're supposed to put on a, a helmet, if you remember, and that's supposed to protect your mind. Uh, you're supposed to protect your mind, you're supposed to protect your heart, which is your affections. You're supposed to protect a lot of things. Uh, so when you think about Satan, is Satan active? Absolutely. A lot of what it is that we struggle with, even if we don't call it spiritual warfare, it's spiritual Warfare. Much like a lot of you have uh, people that have uh, attacked you, maybe your bank account that happened to me, or something else, and it was cyber warfare. They were doing it basically behind the scenes, and they were attacking you. You know, this happens all the time, but when it's spiritual in nature, it's spiritual in answer. When it's spiritual in nature, it is spiritual in answer. And so there is no earthly substitute for what only Jesus, for what only Jesus can give. So, yeah, do I think some of this is Satan? Absolutely. Remember the temptations of Jesus? Satan goes to him when he's at his weakest. He hasn't been eating. He hasn't been drinking. He's exhausted. And he's like, Hello? there he is. You're like, man, why now? That's like the worst time that this guy could show up. And there he was. There he was. And the way that it describes the temptations, they were real for him. He saw the appeal of it. And why did he see the appeal of it? I think the answer is... He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was a man like me. And he knew what it was like. It was Satan, right? We have about time for one more question. Okay. And there are several more that have been submitted that are awesome. So let me encourage you to follow us on social media um, or go to our website. We'll be posting some additional questions and get Jeremy to answer them on social media throughout 
uh, the upcoming dates to try to get some of these other ones in. But these, uh, there's two of them that kind of go together, and I think that's a good, that's a good ending point. And I'll call one. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead. Does God ever give up on you if you doubt for too long? Or is there a point within our doubts when God no longer answers us because he's already given us enough to overcome our doubt? Yeah, is there ever a point when you doubt that God gives up on us? Um, I don't see that. That, that. that I don't see. I mean, Job was pretty blunt. Again, that's why I said, go read Job. Can't be more honest than Job was. Right? I, don't, I don't see that. that At every turn, when Job turned, God was there at every single, at every single turn. It's a different question, though, if you have something like, is there ever a point where God will release us because of the moral choices that we're making? That might connect more to, like, the moral doubts that we're talking about, you know, because you'll feel that. Uh, and I think the answer in that case could be, yeah, you're going to have a season of life where he says, I'm handing you over. And you even see this in the beginning of Romans. If you look at Romans 1 and Romans 2, for example, they are handed over to the way that they have been living, the way that they've been living. You know, it reminds me of this. Somebody, somebody's asked me this question before, and they say, you know, uh, what does that even look like? And it's, it, it, here's the idea of what Paul is saying in Romans 1 and Romans 2, and I hope this helps with the answer. It is when we are so persistent in rebelling against God that God says, all right, then you can have it that way. And I'm not going to basically offer any grace to offset the choices that you're making anymore. You're going to fully experience that life. And you'll see what this life is like. Without me. He says he hands them over to a depraved mind. Literally, he fully hands them over to themselves. Here, here's, the, here's the example that I've used before. I hope that it helps because what it means there, when it talks about perversion in Scripture, that's different than just little fashioned sin, folks. Perversion means that we come to a place where we are like bent in our disposition. We just become completely crooked in our disposition. God hands us over to that. But what does it say that he caused it? Any more than it says when it talks about the hardening of the Pharaoh's heart. It says the Pharaoh hardened his own heart, he hardened his own heart, he hardened his own heart. And then it says, and God hardened the Pharaoh's heart. I always wondered about that. But it's almost like this. You know what concrete is like? You see it driving down the road, and the thing is sitting there spinning and turning. When God takes his hand off, basically what would happen is if you stop spinning the concrete, the concrete is just going to harden. God didn't have to harden the Pharaoh. He was the one by his grace that was spinning him to keep him from himself. And then he got to the point where he says, I'm out. I'm out. And just like that, he leaves the Pharaoh to himself. That's something else that we're going to talk about in Veritas, but what are the choices that we make and how do they shape us? You see in that all over the word of God. I hope some of the answers have helped tonight. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. Here's the thing. Have in mind. Uh, if you go to Veritas of Woodbridge, go to the website, you put your information in, there's a box down at the bottom. I want you to feel free to ask a question. It can become a topic for one of the things that we do on Sunday nights. We're not going to give your name or anything like that, but it gives me something to study up for, prepare, and then to deliver. You're always invited. Go to Veritas of Woodbridge. If you just Google in that, you can put your question in the box, and we're happy to help out. Here's another thing. Over there on the right, there's a wood box. I just talked about boxes. There's a wood box over there. And uh, anything you can give to help out would be great. If you want to keep the coffee flowing, keep, or just keep the lights on, anything you can give would be great. It's basically all I'm going to say about it, because here's the way that we line it. Not. Not only the band, they prepare a song. And we want you just to sit there and listen to it. I think the song's going to minister to you. And then after they're done, I'm going to be hanging around. Please come up if you have more questions. I'm happy to 